How is everybody doing on this Thursday? Boy, what a uh, what a lovely spring we have now. Not so much um, a week ago Saturday where we were removing 11 inches of new wet, really disgusting snow. Um, a lot of work for the snowblower to push. Today it's 85 degrees. And then on Saturday or Sunday, it's supposed to snow again. So um, crazy, crazy, crazy weather here in Wisconsin. Um, welcome to the live as always. And um, one of the things I wanted to talk about before we get rolling is um, wherever you're watching, right below, typically right below the chat roll, the spot where you leave questions, is a banner you can click on and that will get you free downloads. So there's lots of woodworking stuff all loaded into that hub a huge variety of things going on there. Um, so have a look at that when we're done, go click over there and then um, just kind of see what's going on. Lots and lots of great stuff all under one roof with one download click. I'm gonna jump in here because we've got a question from Paul already. Um, Paul says, I'm designing a desk with a cherry top, including drop leaves on each side. As planned, I will be milling rule joints across end grain. I've never milled rule joints and concerned about cutting on the end grain. Any recommendations? So I'm not 100% sure I have this right, but um, I think, and I'm gonna apologize ahead of time for my probably raspy voice. That's why I have the water here. Um, lots of sawdust in the shop today. So. Um, my voice is just a little kerfluated. So anyway, um, if I'm getting this right for Paul, what we've got going with a rule joint is um, very common on drop leaf tables to do this, this kind of a big thumbnail. This is not a round over or a beading cut. It's more, it projects out more than that. It's a little bit more, um, elongated, a little bit more oblong. So this would usually be the main tabletop. And then this would be the drop leaf. And when this is hinged correctly, the um, hinges are down here. When this is hinged correctly, this radius allows that leaf to just drop, to hang down there. So Paul's question is about routing. You know, obviously these are pretty significant profiles if you're in three quarter inch stock. So um, a couple things that um, in my memory, so a bunch of years ago, I did a video and it's, it's available on GOA. Uh, and the project is called a handkerchief table and it has that kind of joint on it. That was the first time I had ever done it. So I know that, um, the first time I did a practice setup, I had the hinge incorrectly located. The joint still worked, and I and don't ask me details on what it is I did wrong because I don't remember. I do. I just remember I screwed it up. Um, and um, when I went back and looked at the directions again, I could see right away where I had gone south on that. And then when I did the final one for the video, it was fine. So one practice. So if you're working in cherry for the project, grab some extra cherry and, and practice this joint a couple times before you cut it on your desk. Two, on your end grain, um, if you can control the amount of material you're removing per pass, that's always a great idea. With this one, it would be easiest not to do it laterally, but to do it vertically. So you can control your depth of cut with the router and do a partial pass. And then usually what I do is I'm trying to leave a very small percentage. So I'm not trying to do a 50-50 kind of thing on my router passes. I'm doing more like a, a math in my head quickly here, um, like 45, 45, 10 percent. So that that last pass is really, 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 really light. The other thing as you're experimenting with these cuts, uh, cherry has a great propensity to burn. So um, as you're experimenting with these cuts, experiment with the RPM of your router. And I think um, most of us, I, on, on my CNC machine, I control the RPM all the time. It's all about chip load. 
and it's all about getting just the right cut. I think most of us, outside of changing the diameter of a bit, which affects the RPM, we don't think about changing the speed in order to get better performance out of a bit. So as you're doing your experiments, um, also mess with the RPM of the router. And you know, you've got to match your feed rate to the RPM, to the chip removal. And what you want to see, it's the same as on a CNC, you want to see chips, not dust. And sometimes running it too high in RPM creates dust instead of shavings because the bit is like, it's running, it's rubbing too fast. It doesn't have the opportunity to cut properly. So you want to um, slow that RPM down a little bit so you can get shavings. So out of all of this, a couple things, more than a couple, um, practice cuts in the same wood so that you're dealing with that cherry that burns so readily. Um, light passes ending in a very light pass to optimize that surface finish. And then with the hardware, make sure you really read and follow the directions for locating it. On mine, like I said, everything worked, but the bottom line was the butt, the pivot point to the hardware of the hinge wasn't quite in the right spot. And um, it was more of a visual thing than a functional thing. Um, and like I said, it still worked when it was done, but it wasn't quite right. So that's what I got. It's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, William says, I have existing cabinets with old style partial overlay doors. I want to replace just the doors with shaker style full overlay. As part of the improvement, I would like to remove the center style on the double wide cabinets. Is this wise? Do those center styles contribute to the structural integrity or is the entire face frame only decorative? So what a great question. Um, so again, I'm going to, I'm going to fall back to the whiteboard here and that's going to kind of help me think this through as well. So it's a face frame style cabinet that currently has a style rail style rail and then there's a center style which typically butts into the bottom of the top rail try to get glare out of this for you um butts into the bottom of the top rail and the top of the bottom rail um so his question is can this be removed so one face frames are not decorative face frames go an incredibly long way to adding rigidity to a cabinet. They really, really do a lot to stiffen it up. Now, in this case, you know, you're not talking about taking the whole face frame off. You're talking about removing only the center style. Um, probably, maybe, um, what I would be potentially concerned with is, um, does this cabinet, if this cabinet doesn't have a center divider, in it, you know, a mid wall in the case, then it's possible that when you're loading this cabinet, and this would primarily be about having stuff on the bottom of the cabinet, uh, is this, are, are we tensioning that center style? And would taking it out over time cause the bottom of the cabinet to do this, to kind of sag away? Maybe. Um, what kind of load would that take? I don't know. Um, probably the cabinet boxes are plywood, which is inherently, you know, as opposed to particle board, um, which is inherently pretty rigid on its own. So you could probably do this. Um, and my qualifier is going to be your mileage may vary. Um, if you take that out, there's some chance that not tomorrow, but over time, um, the case bottom just starts to droop a little bit. The wider this cabinet is, or longer this way, the wider it is, um, the more you're asking of that center style from a rigidity perspective. I typically build my cabinets, and of course on the, on the lower it wouldn't matter because everything is resting on the floor. 
um, and your your weight distribution from the countertop down is spread so much, you're not going to have a problem of sagging on the top. Um, you don't need this as a column so much as you need it as a stretcher on the upper cabinets. I typically build my cabinets in four foot, no more than four foot lengths. Um, that being said, I have built upper cabinets without a center style in them. So part of what that did is it made it easier for them to make the doors. So you're, you're probably okay. You're probably going to be able to take that out and, um, not have any issues, but just to be aware, um, that could be a thing. I prefer, um, I'm with you in regard to, I don't want that in there. I don't want that center style in there because I want full access to the cabinet. All right. Sorry, I touched in the wrong spot there. All right, Richard says, I'm making a large coffee table, game table for my grandson and his wife. They want a lower shelf fit between the legs. The legs are one and five eight square. The shelf is about 28 by 42. I want to include breadboard ends to allow for wood movement. Any suggestions on how to make the breadboard ends, depth of groove, tenons, da 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 da, da other thoughts. So you can do, you know, very traditionally, Breadboard ends have been simply tongue and groove, and there's nothing wrong with that. I've, I've built lots and lots and lots of tables, um, solid wood tables with a tongue and groove breadboard end on them. Works fine. Um, you just have to not, you cannot secure the breadboard end across the width uh, on a 28 inch wide solid wood shelf that thing is going to expand and contract um, maybe as much as a quarter inch from the driest times of winter to the most humid times of summer so the way to think about that would be if you secure the breadboard end in about the center six inches which is what you want to do the expansion and contraction will happen from the about the center from the center out so you would see about an eighth inch change beyond the breadboard end or short of the breadboard end depending on what time of year you build the table um, as the seasons change. So what I'm talking about there is if, if, I, if you build a table with breadboard ends in the winter when it's very dry in this shop and I make the breadboard ends flush with the field, with the grain, with the center part, the panel, in the summer when humidity comes in, the panel is gonna expand beyond the breadboard ends. If I do all this work in the summertime when the humidity is high, in the winter, the field is going to shrink away from the ends of the breadboards, breadboard ends, and then you're going to have a little bit of a step there. And it's just, there is nothing one can do about that. It's just the dynamic of solid wood. It expands and contracts. So this approach that I've described of make the panel, you can do the whole thing as a tongue and groove, but you only glue the center. The rest is allowed to float. That would work for this. There are 11 billion different ways to do this. So there are alternative methods are um, doing a tongue and groove kind of a thing, doing a tenon kind of a thing, and then further down where you don't want to use glue, but you want to hold it in place, you can put a dowel in there, but then the hole in the tenon or tongue needs to be elongated. It needs to be an oval so that the field can move independently of the dowel. What the dowel is doing is holding it in this direction. It's holding the breadboard end tight against the end grain, but it's allowing the panel to move this way. That's another approach. So there are a lot of ways that you could do this, but um, yes, you can do it. And uh, you're obviously already thinking about the wood movement thing. Um, so yes, you can do it, but just make sure that you're keeping the wood movement, keeping it available to wood movement. Um, Frank says, Geo, I cannot get my bandsaw to cut straight line 
even with using the guide, any suggestions? Hey, replaced blade, adjusted the guides. Do you have any ideas? So this is interesting, and there are some it depends for Frank. So cutting straight is one thing. So question number one would be, can you put a straight line on a board and then freehand follow that straight line? So if that answer is no, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's manual skill, there's manipulative skill involved here. You gotta let your fingers do the walking and control it so that you can follow that straight line. Um, but what I'm looking for here is, is the blade sharp. Like a, even if you're good at following a straight line, if the blade is dull, then um, when you push forward, it deflects away from the cut. And it's really, really hard. To, it's almost impossible to follow a straight line. So that's one thing is, can you just follow a pencil line? When you incorporate the, um, when you incorporate the fence, if that's where things are going astray on you, then it's very common on bandsaws that there's drift in the bandsaw blade. So on a table saw, which I'm pointing to, though you can't see it right there, we set the fence relative to the blade, you change the blade, you never have to readjust the fence. On a bandsaw, we change the blade, we tension it, maybe the weld on that blade is a little different than the weld on the last blade. So what can happen is that the bandsaw blade sits a little kerflui, a little kittywampus, relative to the fence, relative to the miter gauge slot in your table. So if all you do is put the, um, put the fence on and assume it's parallel to the blade and you're trying to use the fence and make a straight cut and the material is popping away from the fence or you're getting a lot of cutting pressure, like um, it's sort of the blade is sort of driving the wood toward the fence and it's pinching, then that's because the, the angle of the fence doesn't match the drift of the blade. So we've got stuff online about you, you can't cut till you get the drift. Do you get the drift? Um, you've got to do, you've got to check the drift of the blade and then you have to compensate the fence for the drift to make sure that the two are parallel. Once you've done that, then you should be good to go. So it's something that um, it'll seem painstaking the first time or two you do it, but once you get used to doing the drift check and setting the fence accordingly, then um, it'll go faster for you. And um, using the bandsaw that way is amazing. Like I, I probably do almost as much ripping on my bandsaw as I do on my table saw. One of the benefits of it is the kerf of a bandsaw blade is so small relative to the table saw blade. If I'm cutting something expensive, um, I'd rather cut it on the bandsaw because I'm sending less wood up the dust chute because of that curve size. So lots of compelling reasons to do it. Kenny says, I just started turning. I need help sharpening the chisels freehand. Is there help somewhere? So I would, so yes is the answer. And I would, um, one of the things, let's do this because I think just um, people end up missing this. Hang on. When you go to www.goa.com, the search window is there. And one of the things that I think is incredibly powerful about Woodworkers Guild of America and its online nature is that everything we have done since 2007 is here. Good, bad, or indifferent, it's all here. Um, so me, 30 pounds heavier with more hair, black hair, and a full beard is there. Um, so don't search George with a beard, but you might want to search sharpening lathe chisels. And we've got a pretty extensive turning aspect on the page. If you do this on um, the look on your phone is a little bit different on an, on an iPad or a computer, the search window is there. On a phone, there are three stripes, three bars over here. And when you touch those three bars, that will bring the menu up and also that search opportunity. So have a look there. And, it, and this doesn't matter if it's um, 
breadboard end, mortise and tenon, sharpening lathe chisels, whatever the topic is, that's a really great starting point because then it's, it's going to take you to all the content that we have on that topic. So the short answer is yes, there's help. Um, and that's a really good place to look for it. And it's a great, um, it's a great question because, um, turning honestly is like turning is all about knowing how to sharpen your chisels. And if you can't keep the chisel sharp, it's, it's why carbide tools are so popular is because you don't sharpen them and, um, you turn the cutter to a fresh edge and you go right back to the lathe and keep turning. So, um, it, it, you really need to master keeping your chisel sharp if you want to have any fun turning. What is your preferred method, Bill says, in milling rough lumber into usual usable boards? So it depends. Um, for most of what I receive, most of what I get um, from my supplier comes to me S2S 1316, surface two sides, 1316. So from that pile that I receive, I go straight to my planer to get the two faces parallel to each other and smoother than what the provider the supplier does then from there to my surface sander and then we'll go on from there if you're starting with rough lumber the 100 percent right way to do this is you start on a jointer you face joint one face that's your reference face now that face is dead flat and it's straight when you go to your planer which is the next step that face is down on the bed of the planer, and you plane the opposite face. That's going to make face number dos parallel to face number two, and it's going to give you uniform thickness. This is where you're targeting what thickness do I want this thing to be when it's done. Then you're going to go back to your jointer. Either of those smooth parallel faces go against the fence, and you joint one edge. The jointer will make that edge smooth, straight, square. It's going to give you a reference edge. From there, you go which again, that reference edge goes against the fence of your table saw. You rip 1 16th of an inch oversize. You take the cut edge back to your jointer and you joint the cut edge. Then you go to your miter saw, which you also can't see and you cut one end square then you cut the other end square and that's six square sides when you're all done so face joint plane edge joint rip oversize edge joint end cut end cut and you should be there we have um speaking of wwgoa.com um, one of the i think one of the cool thing one of the fun things that we have on there, if you go to browse, which I just did, and I just have to find it on here. Um, when you go to the browse menu, we're looking at the glare, this right here, post haste projects. It's very fun. It's like some of it is projects, some of it is techniques, but it goes really fast. I'm not talking to the camera and you're saying, thank God right now. I don't talk to the camera. We make it happen in such a way that the video shows it all. So if you click on that or touch it with your pinky, when you go to that, one of the things that's on here, there it is right there, post H project, how to square a board. So everything I just described is covered in that. Russ says, nice shirt, George. I just got a couple like it, wonderful thing. So um, I'm gonna tell this story because there's often a story. So my middle kid, well, you've met Jenny. She's done a boatload of videos with me. And um, Jenny, a bunch of years ago, was diagnosed, diagnosed with Addison's disease, which is considered, um, I'm gonna say it wrong, immune deficiency, right? Um, it's lumped into the same category as HIV. She does not have HIV, she has Addison's disease. So she is an avid blood donator. Because she's lumped into that category, they will not allow her to give blood. So Jenny called me a week or two ago and says, 
and I, I'm a f pretty ardent, I try to go every 56 days. Um, Ginny says to me, she says, you need to go give blood. And I'm like, yeah, I know I do, I'm like, I'm due. She said, no, you need to go give blood because they're giving away these really cool t-shirts and I want one and I want you to give blood, you know, as if parents don't give blood enough for their kids, I'm just saying. She says, I need you to go give blood so that I can get a shirt. So I went and did this yesterday and when they're doing my hemoglobin and blood pressure and um, I said to the person doing that, I told this whole story. And I said, and it's too bad, you know, Ginny would be here if she could be, but she can't. And the woman said, right away, you need to take two shirts, one for you, one for Ginny. So that was great. So I got a shirt, Ginny got a shirt, and they are crazy cool. And they're very nice quality. You know, a lot of times on these giveaways, the fabric is kind of marginal, but they did a great job on this. One should give blood no matter what, if you can. If you can, you should. Um, but when you can couple it with an oatmeal raisin cookie, and a t-shirt, that's a pretty good double dip. Okay, I diverge. Um, Jeffrey says, I'm one and a half hours from you above Cannon Pass. I don't know where that is, Cannon Falls? Is that near Cannon Falls? Um, Cannon Falls is a little, is a beautiful spot south of Minneapolis, St. Paul. Um, this year's winter has been making a lot of adjustments for year round woodworking. Yeah, it's a long cold winter. So, you know, part of, if, if you're a woodworker in this part of the world and you're working in your garage, it better be insulated and heated because um, we have many months of the year. Um, I was trying to backtrack the day it hit 60 for the first time we were trying to remember when that happened last and this was like a week ago and i think it was seven months ago since the last time it was 60. youtube content it's raining comment it's raining in la no ripping wood today because you can't rip when it's raining um oh if that means you got to be outside maybe that's the deal setting us up in the driveway brian says I'm new to woodworking and just used a trim router to cut half inch dados. It worked, but took four passes to complete. If I had a medium or heavy duty router, could you do half inch dados in fewer passes? Yes. Um, so most trim routers are one horsepower or less, which is probably horsepower can be a little funky to talk about. Motor amperage is a little more better. Um, so that's probably a 10 amp motor. A mid-size router, what we would call probably a two and a quarter horse router, is 12 amps. A large router, three and a quarter horse, which is what I have in my router tables, is 15 amp. A 12 amp router, if this is, well, let's say if it's half, half inch deep, half inch wide, half inch deep, three quarter inch wide in plywood with a, with a 12 amp motor, that's a one pass deal. Um, in hardwood with a good sharp router bit, it's probably still a one pass deal. So yeah, it'll be, um, I can see where a trim router would work hard to do that. And especially if you have an older trim router, it might not even be 10 amps. Um, it's, it's relatively recent that like the Bosch Colt is a trim router that is a one horse, um, 10 amp motor. Um, older trim routers probably don't have that much oomph. Peter says, good afternoon, George. I have a shopsmith. After learning to turn bowls, I purchased a speed reducer attachment. Having a lot of trouble with the blank shape, shaking and wobbling. I've tried a chuck and a face plate. Seems the whole system is not stable. What's wrong? Well, I mean, generally, so I, I have some familiarity with um, Shopsmith and the speed reducer, because I worked for Shopsmith for quite a long time, 40 years ago, but for, for quite a long time. Um, so um, generally, you know, if, if bowl turning is leading to shake, it's because the bowl is still eccentric, because the bowl is not round yet. So step one for me with a bowl blank is always a bandsaw and cut it as close to round as you can. Step two is, um, 
I know that that speed reducer has its own mounting system that holds it to the rails on a shopsmith. Make sure that's tight so that that speed reducer can't be moving independently of the um, independently of the machine. Um, the spindle on a shopsmith is relatively small; it's five eighths diameter. So don't overtax it. Um, the spindle on my lathe is an inch and a quarter. Bigger the spindle, the more stability you get. So I, I recognize you got to dance with the one who brung you. You know, you got to you got to work with the spindle that you have. Um, so um, cut it round and um, start at a low RPM where it's not walking itself across the floor. Shopsmith machines are in general very lightweight machines. So good, bad, or indifferent. When I was avidly turning bowls, live edge greenwood bowls on a shopsmith, I had sandbags draped across the lower tubes to add some weight um, because they do walk a lot. So you could try that too. Just add a little bit of weight to the machine. And, and you want to be careful with that. Paul Mayer actually did a great article about this for us. You want to be careful with adding weight to any machine or bolting it to the floor or filling it with concrete or whatever, because there's a little bit of, um, you know, there's a little bit of Darwinism going on there. You're by, by, by seeing the machine wobble, it's telling you that you're running too fast, the bowl is too heavy, the whatever the problem is. If you take away its ability to give you that symptom, then it's possible that you're gonna do stuff on the machine you maybe shouldn't be doing. Um, so um, a couple sanding tubes, or not sanding, a couple sand tubes on the machine to give it a little bit more mass isn't a bad idea. Uh, Robert says, how'd you lose the 30 pounds? Um, Honestly, I, I, well, I started working out a lot. So the whole story with this, because everything has a story, um, I went to Philmont Scout Camp with my kid in 2017. I had been there as a youth, as a 16 year old in 1976. Um, and I was, the, I was the oldest person in the group. So whatever I was at the time doing math in my head. So I was 56 at the time and I was the oldest person in the group by a factor by, by like 10 years. And I was determined not to be the weak link in the chain. So I was pretty motivated to lose the weight. Um, so I got on a treadmill at, at that time. I was still, I was routinely running three miles on the treadmill. I joined a boxing gym and, um, at, this is not like go to a gym and do boxing moves. This is a boxing gym. So, uh, we, we routinely spar. Um, I've sparred dozens of times with other people at the gym. Um, that's a great workout. It's hit high intensity interval training. Um, I was lifting weights ardently at the time. I still do quite a bit of that. Um, so treadmill on the exercise side, treadmill, uh, high intensity interval training, hit training, which was boxing, um, weightlifting. And then a big part of it was portion control. You know, when you go to a restaurant, for me anyway, if I order the hamburger basket, it's a hamburger, it's the bun, it's the fries, it's coleslaw, I don't need that much food. So I, even today, I pretty routinely order a hamburger, don't bring me the bun, and I get a salad instead of fries. And that has done, a, I've, I've maintained the 30 pound loss. Um, and that like retraining of my eating habits was a really, really, really big part of it. And Robert follows up saying, I know how you lost the hair. Well, I do have three kids. So, <laughs> um, that being said, my kids are great. They're, they are very, very, very low maintenance and they always have been. Great grades, avid readers, all good. All right, anyway, Daniel says, I'm gonna start getting familiar with the next wave CNC machine and VCarve software. Where would you suggest I turn for beginner help? Do you offer classes for CNC? I live in Hersey. Um, so yeah, I do. Um, I've got a class here called You Can CNC. It's an eight hour class and um, really with any CNC machine, I feel about 90% of CNC work is managing the software 
which most people use vCarve like you are, um, and then 10% of it is managing the machine. So in that class, we spend most of the day um, working through software. I've, I've got a project, um, I've got a huge monitor, I put that up and click by click, we all go through the same project. So um, you can do that and you're close enough to make that one day class work. Then I've got five CNC machines. So at the end, we go to the machines and we start working with the physical side of it, the machine side of it. Um, years ago, I co-wrote a book with Randy Johnson called CNC Essentials. Subsequently, there was a rewrite that Randy did, I was not involved with. So that book is still, it's a great book. We have it in the WWGOA shop. Um, my name is no longer on the cover of it because Randy did the rewrite, but that is a very good, very well broken down, um, task by task, thing by thing, book resource. Here on WWGOA, if you know, it's funny how there are themes to lives. Sometimes the the theme here is um, whoops, is finding stuff on GOA. So here, if I go back to the WWGOA.com website, browse, and then one of these drop down menus, where am I? Is benchtop CNC. I just can't see it, but it's here. So if you click on that, how can I not find it? There it is. It's the first thing under power tool woodworking. If you click on that benchtop CNC link, there is a boatload of video content there about using CNCs. So live class here, there's one coming up. I don't remember the date. Um, all of that stuff, my classes are on georgevondriska.com. Um, so live class here is an option. Uh, the book Randy did, CNC Essentials is an option and then stuff that's available here on the website is an option. Sorry, I gotta find my spot. We did Shopsmith, we did the CNC. There we go. I tops live this morning and it's like that. I don't know. There's still dust in the shop or something. It really got into my throat. James says how to make a table saw sled for cutting six inch long part. So the blade is cranked over to 45 degrees. This is for a lamp that has a center section made of four boards that form a tall square that is five inches wide and six inches tall. Each board is one and a half inches thick. So it has curve cut in outside with a bandsaw. Oh, that sounds kind of cool. So you put the column together and then you go back and cut the curve. That's probably a pretty cool visual. Um, so let me get, let me see how readily available this thing I'm thinking of is. Yeah, sort of. One of these, dose of these. This sled or jig is in general a great thing to have. And it's very, 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 very easy to make. Gonna dial you down a little. Minus three quarter inch MDF. The key to this is that these things that you can see, let me just zoom, 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 zoom up. Those groovy grooves are not just grooves, they are dovetail sockets. And the reason that they're dovetail sockets is because I'm using these match fit clamps. So match, just like the word match, fit, like the word fit, micro jig, is the company that makes them. Micro jig match fit. This is a dovetail. That's the tail. That's the socket. As a result, when I do this, that's stuck in there. So I can put a thing in here, like, you know, a slab that I want to put a straight edge on. 
and I can clamp it down so it cantilevers past this, run this edge against the fence of my table saw, and then I can cut this. So for you, six inch long boards, you just need spacing that's closer than what I've got going here, but the premise would be the same. Um, these match fit clamps are hugely useful and um, just a great thing. You know, it's one of these things where if you get those in your shop and you use them here and there, you're gonna find more and more and more and more and more spots where they're useful. Micro jig, micro jig, match fit. You probably know micro jig from the gripper. Um, they make a lot of safety stuff. Same company. Mike says, it appears you have a large professional shop. Thank you for calling me a professional. What type of dust collection do you use? Have you used a cyclone style attachment for a dust collector? Might that improve dust collection in a similar shop? So here's, here's my deal. Um, I currently have a dust collector on that side of the shop that is trunked. So it's got a, I gotta look, it's got an eight inch line. No, sorry, it's got a six inch duct coming off of it. I've got another one on that side of the shop with a six inch duct coming off of it. I believe both of those units are 1200 CFM dust collectors. So for me, um, when I got in this building, I already had those dust collectors and I did what I did. I did this current arrangement thinking someday I will get a larger unit with one main trunk. 11 years later, I still haven't done that. I don't know that I will at this point. Um, so part of the separation is because when I have multiple people in here, if I'm doing a class, then that dust collector is picking up on equipment on that side of the shop, that dust collector is picking up on equipment on that side of the shop. So it's split, um, I can split the use of the dust collectors depending on what tools people are using. Neither of those are cyclonic. Um, that is about the extent of my dust collection knowledge. <laughs> you know, it's very experiential with what I have done here. Um, dust collectors have come an extremely long way they're quieter, they're more efficient, they have HEPA filters on them, they have cyclones, they have doo -doo 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 -doo. There's so much stuff going on that it is worth doing more research than what I know. This is like asking me a finishing question and I say, eh, I spray lacquer, that's what I know. I know how to spray lacquer. Um, I know how to connect the dust collectors I have. I'm not real versed in what's going on in the industry. Um, haven't done a tool test on dust collectors ever. So it would, so do a little bit more research as you're making a decision. It's huge, like the aspect of what dust, collect, dust collector do I need? A huge aspect of that is um, table saws require so many CFM to get good pickup. Jointers, there's a CFM number, cubic feet per minute. Band saws, there's a number. So then the next question is, do you work by yourself all the time? You're only going to use one tool at a time and pick up at one tool at a time, or will there be multiple people? So you got to be able to collect from more than one tool. How long is the run going to be? So my shop is 80 feet long. If the dust collector is at the end and I have to come, oh, I have to overcome 80 feet of pipe in order to have good dust collection at my table saw, I have to have a really big dust collector down there to do that. If my shop is smaller and a smaller run, that's different. If I'm gonna move the dust collector to each tool as I need it, that's different. So there's there's a lot of stuff going on there that are questions I can't answer, but I know, I know the questions, I don't know the answers. Rich asks, how old are you? I am 62 this year. I mean, I'm 62 now. I'm going to be 63 this year. Um, Jeffrey asks, what bandsaw to use for green logs? I was going to go Oh, bandsaw blade, I'm sorry. I was going to go carbide, but I'm leaning toward a couple timber wolves instead. A lot of sycamore to do. I use timber wolf blades. Yep, so I use the, I believe it's a three tooth, um, three quarter inch 
Timberwolf played. And here's your best bet. Timberwolf, uh, so P.S. Wood, the letters P.S., the word Wood, pswood.com. They sell Timberwolf blades. The staff there are amazing. So what I would do, look them up online, 800 number, call them. Sorry, I have a big tickle. Call them and say, I have this bandsaw. This is what I want to do. And they're going to say, well, Jeffrey, we recommend you get this blade. They are extremely knowledgeable. And there's a difference between their blade technology for green wood and, and the size of the blade for green wet wood versus kiln dried wood is part of the equation. So there's a lot going on there that um, they can help you with. <coughs> Daniel says, I'm looking at the book as you speak. Great book. Yeah, Randy did, you know, I, I think Randy and I did a great job. Um, Book number one, I did all the photography for, I did all the screen captures. Um, and then Randy revised it. Part of the rationale, part of the reason was we did it with VCARV 8.5. I think VCARV is currently up to 11. I think he used VCARV 10 for the current version. So as it relates to the software, it's more up to date than the first version was. Uh, Neil says, I've turned several bowls out of walnut and other woods and find as I am sanding them, I have trouble with the end grain areas, getting them to smooth out like the rest of the areas. They also have a tendency to cloud over as I get to the finer grits. I've tried washing the areas with lacquer thinner to clear the end grain, but it doesn't seem to help much. I've, I've had to go back to coarser grit to work it out. Any idea what causes this? Now can I avoid it? I think, I'm sorry, but I think you're not sanding enough at a lower grit to actually get the end grain smooth before you graduate to a finer grit. So what happens, you know, as you turn a bowl, you're seeing end grain twice. Um, trying to find a good example. Come on. So on this bowl, there's pith. And there's pith, so end grain is here and end grain is here. So seeing end grain twice as this turns, end grain, end grain. So depending on your cutting technique, if you're scraping, if you're doing a scraping technique on all your bowls, that inherently does not provide a great surface finish. So you really need to spend a lot of time early in sanding to make sure that you get that end grain smoothed out before you go up to the next grit. If I were scraping these bowls, I'd be starting at 80 grit in a power sander. Power sander meaning I have, um, I have bowl sanding discs, or yeah, discs I guess. So that's my bowl sanding attachment, goes in a cordless drill. This is flexible, the yellow part is flexible, so when I push that against the curved side, it can conform. It's hook and loop, so it's very easy to go from one grit to another. This is a two inch, which I would use on a smaller bowl. There's another bucket over there that's got my three inch in it that I would use on larger bowls. Um, and power sanding with a drill beats the heck out of just standing there with sandpaper and draping it over the bowl. So spend more time at a lower grid. And the way to think about it is um, the first sandpaper takes out the tool marks. If that's 80 grit, 100 grit takes out the 80 grit marks. Don't go on until the 80 grit marks are gone. 120 takes out the 100 grit marks. So um, it's hard to not get bored or, or think you're there, but put, put a really good light over your lathe um, you can always wipe it. Um, if you think you're ready to go to the next grit, wipe the bowl with mineral spirits and see what it looks like. The mineral spirits are going to help reveal if you still have tool marks, if you still have tear out in the end grain, if you still have sanding marks, they're going to reveal those little swirls. So basically what we're trying to do is get to 220 grit so that the swirls are so small, the human eye can't see them. That's what's going on there. 
Um, someone says, I just wrapped up a fence using redwood. Should I let it go gray or finish it with something? Yes. Gray is in the eye of the beholder. Some people like it. Some people don't. So um, redwood, cedar, they can live outside because they're, they're naturally weather resistant. They can live outside, but they're going to silver or gray over time. And if you don't like how that's going to look, then a sealer on there would prevent that from happening. And then if on the heels of that, the next question becomes, um, what sealer? My answer is yes. Um, my answer with that would be, go to a finishing place in your area, just because environmental conditions are different. If your redwood fence is in Arizona, where it gets hot enough to bake an egg on the sidewalk, that is probably a different product you need to seal that redwood than what we would use here in Wisconsin. So um, it's, it's strictly aesthetic. If you don't mind it being gray, some people don't, then um, leave it natural. Um, but if you want to protect that color it has today, you would need to put a sealer on it. Um, Rich says, I have a small CNC engraver. It runs on candle program. Have you ever heard of it? New no. candle. No. Um, Fusion 360 is pretty commonly used for CNC stuff outside of VCARB. And Fusion 360 plays nice with a lot of other stuff. 3D printers, lasers, engravers. Um, that's part of the reason people master that. Um, but um, candle, I have not heard of. Jim says, hi, George, great content today. Thank you very much. I have an older bandsaw. Recently, I changed the blade and then put my resaw blade back in. It no longer tracks straight. What am I doing wrong or is it just dull? 14 inch saw with a 5 eighths, four TPI blade. So it could be, I mean, the other thing you always gotta be really careful of when you're taking bandsaw blades in and out is if the teeth rub against the metal part of the bandsaw, that can really adversely affect the blade. If you're, a, if you're a chainsaw user, you may have found if you hit something with a chainsaw chain, it can happen that it cuts, it wants to cut a curve because it's sharp on one side, not on the other. So that sharp side of the chain is leading the cut. Same with a bandsaw blade. If something happens as you're installing it or uninstalling it, and you've kind of taken the sharpness or the set off the teeth on one side, that can cause it to go kerflui like you're describing. Um, easiest thing would be take it off, put on another, you know, don't throw it out. Um, take it off, put on another 5 eighths blade and see if you get a performance increase. And if you do, then that tells you that the old one was shot. Um, check your tension. Um, if you're, if the blade does not have enough tension on it, when you push on the front of the blade, it tends to kind of dog leg, it, it deflects away from the cut, even if it's sharp. So make sure that your tension is correctly set before you take the existing one off. John says, hi, George, is sanding sealer the same as mineral spirits for identifying marks? No, 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 no. So sanding sealer is a sealer, it's a finish. And um, generally the deal is um, sanding sealer has got more body to it, more solids in it. So when you put it on as a base coat, it helps fill grain. So then when you top coat over that with lacquer, polyurethane, water-based finish, whatever it is, you get a better end result. So uh, mineral spirits is mineral spirits, and that's a solvent. Sanding sealer is a finish, is a sealer, and that, that goes in the finishing category. Clay says, good afternoon. About to stain some white oak. What sanding grit should I start staining? Thanks for sharing. Um, I typically sand to 220, 221, whatever it takes, cultural reference. Um, I typically sand to 220 and don't go beyond that. So I would try that, you know, first job is 
scrap white oak and see um, how that looks under the 200, 220 grit and go from there. As a side note, because you're in white oak, um, Gary Coyne did a really good article for me on fuming oak. Um, and um, low tech, he makes a fuming chamber out of one by twos and two by twos, furring strips and plastic. And then he fumes the oak inside that chamber. Um, if you're not familiar with fuming, um, it's a process where you're just chemically by literally putting, I think it's just ammonia um, in the chamber with the furniture, it turns it a really amazing color. So very cool, check that article. Um, Rich asks, sanding raises grain, does it? So no, sanding, see so you're doing sanding to knock the grain fuzz down. Water raises, water raises the grain. So a uh, couple of public service announcements. Um, I mentioned at the top of this, um, right below where you're watching, there's a banner that says, get freebies now. What's better than free? What's a better price than free? So um, have a look at that. Well, we have compiled a lot of woodworking content into a single hub. So go look at that and look at the downloads for that. Um, it's, a, it's a bunch of information all under one roof. In, um, in the near future, about a month from now, I'm teaching cabinet making at the Mark Adams School down in Indiana. I, Mark takes the sign up. I don't know if there are openings or not, but if you're interested in that, contact the school. Um, it's a week long cabinet making class at Mark Adams here in Wisconsin. Um, again, georgefondriska.com is where that stuff is. I've got a cabinet making class coming up. I've got a CNC class coming up. Meet the Makers is coming up very soon, June 17th. Free event, uh, Matt Carmona, Paul Mayer, Matt Coppersmith, I'm gonna leave people out. A bunch of local content creators and makers will be here at my shop. It's an open house, come hang out. There'll be demos going on. I'm gonna be doing blacksmithing demos. Um, we're gonna have door prizes to give away, a lot, a lot of cool stuff going on that day. June 17th, information is on my website, georgevondriska.com. Other than that, I tap danced a little to see if we um, got anything new. We're good to go. So thanks for watching. And uh, hopefully in your world, the weather's as nice as it is here. The motorcycle, I have a lovely Indian Roadmaster, is calling my name. So let's check out Max. Big thank you to Max, who's behind the boards, keeping the tech side going. I will see all of you the next time we're live.